Okay, welcome everybody, um, or anybody, <laughs> if anybody's out there. Uh, Luke and I, we were we were meant to do this yesterday, but things things got um, just difficult. Food. Yeah, 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 and so we decided we'd give it a, a whirl tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're going through a book called. The Rediscovery of Meaning and Other Essays by Owen Barfield. Yeah. <laughs> and we read, we read a, uh, an essay that we're going to read through called The Harp and the Camera. And I can't direct anybody to a PDF because I don't think it's available on PDF anywhere that I know of anyway. Um, but. Yeah, I tried looking even before this and i i couldn't find one anywhere so is what we're doing illegal are we allowed to no no we can totally yeah it's a book club we're having a book club <laughs> exactly <laughs> when it's not this hi matthew uh. <laughs> hey, okay Matt. so we're, we're gonna do a read through first and um and then you know i'll throw a link in at some point and um so you, it's not that long. How many? Gosh, I don't know. I well, maybe it's longer than I thought. <laughs> it is, it is actually kind of long. Oh, I don't know, 10, 15 pages. Yeah, we'll see how far we get. We'll just go with it. Yeah, and if we find stuff we need to pause on, I'm cool with that. So. Um, yeah, well, I think we'll just keep our regular format, you know, with reading and talking and stuff like that. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I guess that's all we can really do. <laughs> I like these limitations. These are great margins to live in. Um, not too bad, not too bad. Yeah. I suppose, if you don't mind, I'll start. And then yeah, go we'll for it. Keep on, keep on going. Mm -hmm. The harp and the camera. The harp has long been employed as a symbol of music in general and of heavenly music in particular just as music itself has been employed as a symbol of heaven on earth. As the English poet Walter de la Mer put it, when music sounds, all that I was, I am. Heir to this haunt of brooding dust, I came. In Ireland, the harp is a national symbol. It is even on their postage stamps. I remember when I was young, a popular song that began, just a little bit of heaven fell out of the sky one day and dropped into the ocean not so many miles away. Years later, I came to suspect a grain of substance was underlying that sentimental drivel. If you live in Scotland, then you go to Ireland, you see first the Scottish mountains and then the Irish mountains, and they are not very much alike in many ways. And, and they, they, are, they, they, are, they are very much alike, actually. Yeah. In both places, it is probably raining. It will be a minute or so. A minute or two, yet there is a subtle difference between them, the kind of subtlety that really needs a combination of Ruskin and Henry James to put into words. Perhaps you could put it crudely like this. The Scottish mountains, in the Scottish mountains, you feel the mountains are somehow big, are being drawn up into the sky. The earth seems to have been raised up to the sky and to have mingled with it, whereas in Ireland, it is the other way around. It is almost as if, it, as if the mountains were actually a part of the sky that had come down and was mingling with earth. There is a one-of-a-kind harp, which most of us have never seen. I have never seen one myself, and that is the Aeolian harp, or, as I shall call it for short, the, the wind harp, since Aeolus was a Greek god of the winds. It sounds a delightful instrument, and I have always meant, but have somehow never managed to make one. It is simply a series of strings in a box, which you fix up somewhere where the wind will blow through the strings and the strings will sound. A good place is an open window. And that might perhaps remind us that the earliest windows were not a kind that we have today with glass in them. They were designed not for letting in light and keeping out the air, but for letting in both of them together. In fact, the word window is a corruption of wind eye. The wind harp has been much more written about than it has been seen or heard. 
it has a very special fascination for the Romantics. The German poet Edward Morick speaks of, let's try this. <laughs> I, I, I can do it if you want. Einer Luftgeborgen, I'm going to impress you. Okay. Einer Luftgeborgen, Geboren Muse, Geheismenis Vos, Spiel. Okay, I'm gonna. I gotta fix that. Okay, it's like it's like a wrinkly bed sheet. Einer Luftgeborene Muse, Geheimnisvolles Seitenspiel. Ooh, that was so good. <laughs> Secret string melody of an airborne muse. Today, perhaps it would be safer to say windborn. And describes how, when the wind grows more violent, the harp gives out a kind of human cry. The wind makes a sound of its own, but in the harp's strings, it echoes or imitates itself with a would-be personal sound that reproduces the cosmic and personal sound of the wind itself. William Wordsworth begins his long poem, The Prelude, by speaking of the Aeolian visitations. And in a later passage of the poem, where he is describing the crossing of the Alps, although the wind harp is not mentioned, he probably has it in mind when he speaks of a stream that flowed into a kindred stream, a gale confederate with the human, with the current of the soul. I gotta read that again. A stream that flowed into the kindred stream, a gale confederate with the current of the soul. Many of the great romantics were as much interested in the theory of poetry as they were in writing poetry. So Wordsworth's Confederate gales represented to him not just a flight of fancy, but really an avowed part of his theory of the nature of poetry, or rather of his whole aesthetic theory, that is, the whole theory of the relation between man and nature and perception, considered especially in the realm of art. Now you find in reading the Romantics that sometimes their theory of poetry is embodied in the poetry itself. That is the case with Coleridge, Coleridge's poem, The Aeolian Harp, where you find these often quoted lines. And what if all animated nature be but organic harps diversely framed that tremble into thought as or aor or, or that sweeps as o'er them sweeps, plastic and vast, one intellectual breeze, at once the soul of each and God of all. But more often, perhaps, the theory is kept apart from the practice and is expressed in prose. There is Shelley, for instance. The wind harp, as you might expect, made a very strong appeal to his imagination. You find in his early essay on Christianity, Christianity, the passage, there is a power by which we are surrounded, like the atmosphere in which some motionless lyre is suspended, which visits with its breath on our silent chords at will. He is depicting the genesis of poetry, but if poetry is merely the wind that agitates the wind harp, what is a poet? Well, Shelley has his answer in the same early essay and you remember that, as with, that it was an attack on Christianity. He tells us that poets are the passive slaves of some higher and more omnipotent power. This power is God. Did he really think that? If we conceive of the genesis of poetry in terms of something like inspiration, as perhaps we must, we are at once faced with a difficult question. What is the part it played by the poet? What is the part in it played by the poet himself? That always has been a difficult question and remains one now, whether we speak as Shelley does of the breath of the universal being or of the unconscious or of the id within the unconscious or whatever terminology we choose to adopt, we still have an extremely difficult question. And so a few years later, when Shelley came to write his defense of poetry, he felt he had to make his wind harp a little more complicated. He now put it this way. Man is an instrument over which a series of external and internal impressions are driven, like the alternations of an ever-changing wind over an aeolian lyre, which move it by their motion to ever-changing melody. 
but there's a principle within the human being and perhaps within all sentient beings which acts otherwise than the lyre and produces not a melody alone, but harmony by an internal adjustment of the sounds or motions thus excited to the impressions which excite them. Okay, hang on a minute now. Um, I'm wondering if I should read that quote from Desmond. Yeah, okay. I, I think that'd be great. Right here. Um, okay, so there's a, there's a book written by a psychologist named Matthias Desmond. Oops, I've got to put the, uh, the old glasses back on. <laughs> uh, and uh, he wrote it. It's called The Psychology of Totalitarianism. And believe me, and I've told this to many, many people, it's not what you think it is. <laughs> but um, he has in the very beginning of, of, this, uh, of this book, he talks a lot about resonance. And um, it kind of weaves its way throughout the book. But um, when I read this essay and I got to that thing by Shelley, man is an instrument over which a series of external and internal impressions are driven, I was immediately reminded of this, this quote by Matthias Desmet. So he says, the child has already become familiar with its mother's voice in the womb Life in the womb has predestined it to resonate with that specific voice. After birth, the child further develops this primal resonance. This doesn't happen haphazardly. The child achieves a kind of symbiosis with the mother through its cre creative imitations of her sounds and facial expressions. In this way, it will feel what she feels. So I'm just going to... I just want to reiterate that because um, when the child, and he'll, he'll expand on it, but when the child imitates the mother's facial expression and sounds, it actually feels what she's feeling, okay? As it takes on its mother's happy expression, it also feels her joy. If it takes on her sad expression, it shares in her unhappiness. Something similar applies to the exchange of sounds in the clinking and clanging of the mother's language trembles the well and woe of her being. And the child who imitates that language resonates with it on the same psychological wavelength. This early resonance between child and its social environment leads to a unique phenomenon. The young child's body gets loaded with a series of vibrations and tensions that become embedded in the deepest and finest fibers of its body. They form a kind of body memory that not only programs the function of the musculature, glands, nerves, and organs, but also predisposes the child to, a certain, to certain psychological conditions or disorders. The human body is, in the most literal sense, a stringed instrument. The muscles that span the skeleton and the body's other fibers are put on a certain tension in early childhood through imitative language exchanges. Mm -hmm. This tension determines with which social phenomenon one will resonate. It determines the frequencies to which one will be sensitive in later life. That's why certain people and certain events can literally strike a chord. They can touch the body and as such touch the soul. It is for this reason that the voice can make the body ill or conversely, heal it. Okay. I just wanted to throw that in there right after that beautiful Shelley quote. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to find, maybe I can find them, but there's a couple of albums with that are just Aeolian harp, and you could just type it in on YouTube too, but there's, even on Spotify, you can, um, you can find some artists that uh, I guess they're simply do you recording. Wanna, do you want to give me a give me a, um, a link here? Or just yeah, and I can I can find it on Spotify and throw it in if you want. Well, I'm not finding hmm. the one that I really loved. That's the problem. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I'm struggling mm -hmm. right now. Okay. But. Um, 
Yeah, there's there's so much. And you can find one on like there's people in Ireland and Scotland that put these harps on mountaintops, you know, yeah. so you can put one in a window, which I think is a really cool idea. And I want to do it. At, I want to make one now and put one in my, house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love wind chimes and stuff. Wind chimes are so cool, but I know I have several and um, I can actually start to tell the, the weather, what the weather's doing because certain songs will be played. Right. And um, wow. yeah. So it's it's kind of cool actually. It's it's tuning me into something totally new. That's so cool. I didn't yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. if the wind comes from a certain direction, right? And and the the speed of the wind and all that stuff, then mm -hmm. different different pipes on my chimes will go and yeah, so it's kind of nice actually. Yeah, no, that's yeah. So you can put one in a window. You can put one on a mountain. I've yeah. seen actual you know like the the normal shape of i guess the most iconic shape of a harp you know you could put something like that up on a mountain and the wind right. will play it depending on you know how violent the wind is but even even he says here that line of um When the wind grows more violent, the harp gives out a kind of human cry. Mm -hmm. The wind makes a sound of its own, but the harp strings, it echoes or imitates itself with a would-be personal sound that reproduces the cosmic impersonal sound of the wind itself. <laughs> Which is, yeah, it can it can almost be kind of haunting when you hear some of these. Well, I, I think when we talked about, because we've talked about alien harps, so this is kind of interesting, everyone, because Luke and I have talked about alien harps, I don't know, like almost a year ago or something. <laughs> yeah. And then he shared with me some stuff. Work. Yeah, and then and then and then here comes this this essay. But um somewhere I read that that, that whole myth of the sirens right? That Greek myth of the sirens. Um, there's a theory that near these cliffs somewhere in Greece, they used to dry goat skins. So they'd hang these goat skins on the cliffs. And of course, they would just get hard, right? But they goat skin is really thin, hide. And, and then when the when the wind would hit them, it would make this haunting sound, right? And, and um, I don't know, I don't know how, you know, true this is, but I read it somewhere that this is a theory that this is where this myth came from, that the sailors would hear it. And, um, and of course, because it was on cliffs, there was dangerous rock in the waters. And then they're, you know, they go in to see what it would be. And then, yeah. Yeah. What are these noises? Let's yeah. And maybe it. it, maybe it gave a human cry, right? If the wind was really howling. <laughs> And imagine if this technology, or if you want to call it a technology, we'll get into that. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if that, imagine that convergence of events in like antiquity, like mm -hmm. Greek myth we're talking about, you know, it's know. Like we're going way back. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, to totally where we were at actually okay so it's right after the quote from shelly um so we now so we have now a principle page 97 okay. yeah so we have now a principle which acts otherwise than the liar than in the liar in one field he has changed the symbol to something more than an ordinary liar or harp something more even than wind harp something more like a kind of magic harp that somehow plays itself by being played on. But then again, does it play itself? Later in the same essay, we have him saying, it is those poets who have been harmonized by their own will who give forth the divinest melody when the breath of the universal being sweeps over their frame. Then it is rather different from the passive slave we heard of before. You might think it is a rather queer sort of passive slave who has to have the will of his own. Mm -hmm. 
my idea of a slave, and I'm pretty sure it was shared by the author of Prometheus Unbound, is someone who is just not allowed to have a will of his own. The title of this lecture is The Harp and the Camera, and while I've been talking about harps, you may have been privately wondering <laughs> when I'm going to come to cameras, and what on earth the two have to do with each other. I must first tell you how they came linked together in my mind. The trick was done for me by one very remarkable man. He was a German Jesuit called Athanasius Kircher, and he lived some 300 years ago. Kircher was a polymath, if there ever was one. He studied a variety of subjects, including, and these are not the only ones, music, Egyptology, sinology, botany, magnetism. In the course of his life, he had himself let down into a crater of Vesuvius, and he was claimed as the founder of geology. But besides his book on music, he also wrote one on optics, which is called Ars Magna Lucis et Umbre. I must mention here, and I am kind of, a, and I am indebted for my acquaintance with Kircher, and there within the germ for this lecture to H.N. Abrams, the author of that truly admirable book, The Mirror and the Lamp. Hang on a second. Uh, I just want to let Lance know there's no link to the essay. We couldn't find, I couldn't find a PDF for it, Lance. Right. Kind of disappointing. Yeah, sorry. I have to buy the book. Here's the book. Because <laughs> we're going to go through a few of these. Do you so see the moon on there? It's a full moon tonight, by the way. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's a snow moon. It's a snow moon. That's right. I, I read that this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just needed to say that. Um, I am indebted to H.M. Abrams, the author of that truly admirable book, admirable book, The Mirror and the Lamp, in which the notes are almost as excellent as the text. Now, Kircher is the first writer to have described the wind harp. Whether he actually invented it is disputed, and indeed there is an old tradition that it was invented by St. Dustin. St. Dustin is also the patron saint of the blind, and whether there is any significance to that, I shall leave you to ask yourselves at the end of this lecture. <laughs> I just, I just, I just clicked with that. <laughs> yeah. Just now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, it was during the hundred or so years after Kircher's death that the Aeolian harp became a popular tenant's fixture. Quite a lot of people had one as a normal addition to the amenities of a house. Then, towards the end of the 18th century, it seems to have died away as a toy and begun a second life as a symbol. It was adopted, as I have said, as a favorite symbol by the Romantics. Okay, it I just want to pause here so that we could talk about this. Um... Yeah, kind of condensed the, the idea of why it became a symbol for the romantics, because, you know, like that quote from Shelley, he says, he says, um, but there is a principle within the human being, perhaps within all sentient beings, which acts otherwise than in the lyre and produces not melody alone, but harmony. Mm -hmm. So there, the romantics are seeing the Aeolian harp as an actual poet, right? That, that the wind, which would be for them spirit, breath, wind, it would be all those things, mm -hmm. was, was playing it. And there is a sense when you write poetry that, that you're, you're channeling something, right? But it's not, it's not like, you, it's not automatic writing. It's, it's a cooperation, you know, with the muse, Let's call it something yeah. like that. And um, and so I would, I'm just going to, you know, say that essentially for them, the muse was the wind, right? Mm -hmm. In 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 the in the example that they're giving with the Aeolian harp, and they're and they're they're the harp, right? And I don't think that's I, for the Romantics at least. And correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think that the idea of breath or wind was divorced from that very, I don't know, biblical notion of right. the, no, breath yeah. being the breath of God or the wind being the Holy Spirit or, exactly. you know, like that. So those things were 
those things were playing and and, and it's all wrapped up in nature too right yes like yeah. it's part it's part of the it's part of the natural world which the is... wind blows where it will and mm -hmm. you are and you are you're setting yourself up just like that Matthias it... Desmet quote like your body yeah. you know, your musculature your <laughs> who you are in your body is, is the channel for what, mm -hmm. will, what will emerge from your own mouth. So the part you play as the poet is, I don't even know how you, I, cause this is where I get a little confused is like, there's some kind of resistance from the strings of the harp that. Um, well, it's the tension on the harp. Like yeah. it's, it's the tension, the innate tension that allows mm -hmm. the wind to play the string. Right. Yeah. So it doesn't resist the the wind. Sure. Yes. Right. It, but it it it's set up with with this tension with this tension already there, and um, yeah. yeah. Down so a ton resistance of is the wrong word because we're talking about harmony, not. Yeah. Resistance. So there's a kind of accord, accord. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And now suddenly your language comes to life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's talk about dead metaphors. Let's uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, let's bring yeah. them back. <laughs> let's bring them back. Yeah, resuscitating yeah. dead metaphors. <laughs> That's why Barfield is is maybe really he's good at that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it totally is. Yeah. Um, Gosh, I keep on looking away and then I forget where we are. Uh, well, I interrupted you, but let me see. I think it's, um, but at 99, but there is another quite different invention. Yes, thank you. But there is another quite different invention in the development of which the same man, Athanasius Kircher, seemed to have taken a leading part. And that is the camera obscura. Moreover, it is agreed, I think, that he is the actual inventor of yet a third device and one which occupies a very important place in what I shall later on be calling the camera sequence. But let us begin with the camera obscura, which Kircher both describes and improved, though he probably did not invent it. It is, as I expect you know, something like a box with one single very small aperture. One could perhaps think of the aperture as a tiny window. It is either so small as I'm thinking about the tiny window now in the relation of aeolian harps to windows in the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it is either so small as scarcely to deserve the name, just a pinprick, in fact, or else, though not quite so small as a pinprick, it is very small and is filled with a particular sort of glass, which we now call a lens. Inside the box, you fix a mirror disposed at, I think, at an angle of 45 degrees. And the result is that by looking through the larger aperture in the top of the box, you receive a picture in miniature of all that the focus light brings in through the, the tiny one. That all the focus light brings in with it through the tiny one. Mm -hmm. Reflecting on those two very different ploys of Athanasius Kircher, it struck me that if the wind harp can be seen as a kind of emblem of the romantic movement or the romantic period, if you like, the camera obscura is no less an emblem of the Renaissance. Only in this case, it is a good deal more than an emblem. And it is an emblem of a good deal more than the Renaissance. It points us to something that underlay the Renaissance and came to expression, not only in the revival of learning, but also in such other historical movements as on the one hand, the Protestant Reformation, and on the other, the birth of modern science. In other words, it is the emblem of that species of Copernican revolution in the human psyche, which was, you, which was quite as much the case as it was as a consequence of the Copernican revolution in astronomy. I mean, cause, cause. cause. It was quite as, quite as much the cause as it was the consequence. Oh, I thought you yeah. said cause. Sorry. No, no, cause. <laughs> it was quite as much the cause as it was the consequence of the Cop Copernican revolution in astronomy. Okay, yeah. there's clarity. I mean the revolution formulated rather than initiated by Immanuel Kant, whereby the human mind more or less reversed its conception of its own relation to its environment. 
It is more than an emblem because the camera obscura, considered as the original source of the human of the whole camera sequence, was also instrumental in actually bringing about the change in which I have spoken. We may better call it a symbol since the camera sequence as a whole was a part of the change in which it betokens or symbolizes. You know it has been said that the proper definition of a symbol is that it both represents something other than itself and is also a part of it. Coleridge defined a symbol as a part of the reality it represents. For that reason, he held a historical event may be a symbol of the historical process of which it is a part. It is precisely in this sense that I am trying to claim the invention of the camera as a symbol of the post-Renaissance man. Yeah, so I, that's, I found that really, really helpful, actually, when I read that the first time. Um, the symbol is, the proper definition of a symbol is that it both represents something other than itself and is also a part of it. And so, like, here he's, and this is very Barfield, right? He's showing that it's through the evolution of consciousness that these inventions actually come to be. You know, like, you always you, you always have to ask the question, what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Was it, was it um, the camera obscura that changed the consciousness, or was it the consciousness that brought the cam camera obscura into existence and yeah. I get the sense from him because of the scientific revolution and all that stuff that it it was actually a change in the consciousness that brought about the invention of the camera obscura and this is not this is not something that we naturally um, consider right we would we would think that the camera obscura changed our consciousness. I think that that would be the first line of reasoning. At least for me, it would be. Right? Yeah. But Bar Barfield yeah. Likes, likes to flip it around oftentimes and show you how, no, these things don't come into existence without the consciousness actually changing, right? And so um, um, he says here, in other words, it is an emblem of that species of Copernican revolution in the human psyche, which was quite as much the cause as it was the consequence of the Copernican revolution in astronomy. So this is the chicken and egg thing, right? Yeah. Which we're not going to narrow down, huh? <laughs> but, <laughs> but. Well, I think for I think for Barfield, he he actually puts more weight on on yeah. the evolution of consciousness than he would the the things that we can actually see happening around us, right? So, well, he even says it's a revival of learning, which the Renaissance, I think, that is. Yeah. There's no better way of really saying uh, what took place in the Renaissance, like a revival of learning, but. A revival suggests that there was a, a a kind of learning that took place well before the Renaissance. Like another yeah. epoch further back in time where learning was the president, you know, or whatever. <laughs> and then like learning died down maybe through the medieval period. Like learning was not as important. Maybe experience in some of these other things were more important than than human learning and and then we focus back on learning and then we see in the renaissance a new kind of learning probably emerging um a scientific learning which coincided with the protestant revolution so he's saying or the protestant reformation revolution well it was a revolution <laughs> <actually>. <laughs> the peasants at the pope's door <laughs> Oh, sorry, I had too much fun with that one. Um, okay. Yeah. I can keep going if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Let us now have a look at this camera sequence. In the world in which the camera obscura was invented in the 16th and 17th centuries, there was yet no such thing as, a, as photography. 
There could not have been since the camera obscura, obscura itself was the photographic camera in embryo. Besides therefore being an amusing toy, the camera obscura quickly became used for practical purposes. For the production of reduced size sketches of larger objects or assemblies of objects, and particularly, particularly in the business of sketching landscapes. There on the screen, you had a complex three-dimensional real world in which we could walk about on legs, conveniently reduced to a little two-dimensional image which a pencil had only to trace. In other words, this convenient device affected, almost on its own occur accord, a result which many great painters had been trying very hard for a large number of years to learn how to bring about, in which, and in which they were just beginning to succeed. There you had given to you a picture drawn very accurate, accurately in perspective. Now, if you had, <clears throat> sorry, now, if it is true that the painters had been trying for a number of years to bring about the use of perspective to discover what it was, it is also true that in terms of the whole history of the art of painting, that number is really a very small one. That number is really a very small one. In fact, the gradual and very late discovery of the secret of perspective seems to me to be a truly remarkable phenomenon. I ask you to consider in support of that con contention, the following five facts. There had been for centuries past many great and skillful painters, painters passionately interested in the technique of their art. Secondly, geometry was the study of highly advanced amongst the, Greece, the Greeks. Thirdly, the Greeks were perfectly well able to apply their discoveries in geometry to the practice of art, to architect, architecture, for instance. For if you read about the principles on which the building of the Pantheon was conducted, you will find almost elaborate geometrical principles embodied in it. Fourthly, Euclid himself actually wrote a work on optics. Euclid, the founder of geometry, wrote a work on optics, although that work is lost. <laughs> and lastly, the Greek theory of art, whether of sculpture or poetry or painting, was a theory of imitation imitation of nature. Now keep all that in mind and recall that nevertheless, European painters only began to interest themselves in the contempt, com sorry, European painters only began to interest themselves in the comparatively simple rules of perspective in perhaps the 14th and 15th century AD. In perspective, which is the kingpin, one could say, of the whole craft of representing three dimensions in two. When it did happen, not only were they interested, but they were wildly excited. There is a story somewhere, I believe it is in Vasari, of an Italian painter who walked about the streets and I believe he also woke up his wife at night constantly repeating, che dolce cosa è questa perspectiva. <laughs> What a lovely thing this perspective is. <laughs> <laughs> he woke up he's excited. <laughs> yeah, he used stoked. He woke up his wife screaming. <laughs> Leonardo's reflections led him to the conclusion that you should make your picture look like an actual scene reflected on a large mirror. And actually, when the camera obscura came and he heard of it, he soon went on to it. I just have to say... Remember your fortune cookie? If we are all worms, try to be a glow worm. <laughs> You're totally a glow worm right now. <laughs> I've got all three per color, like light, per light, you know, I've got yeah. this girl light right here. So, <laughs> anyways, hmm. yeah. So, this is interesting though. I, d I don't know how to, <clears throat> like, this is he describing in this moment, what kind of changed even as a, as a desire in art or as a pursuit in art to represent what is actually there in nature, as we, we've always seen it as a crude representation. So you can go back to cave paintings or like, uh, what have you, like you could go back to like a Neanderthal cave painting and you can see these things like crudely represented through the means that were available. Yeah. 
But as soon as you're able to make this more precise, as soon as you're able to bring this into some kind of precision or crystallization to a certain degree, it's like the objective changes. Now, what we pursue in art is not necessarily the um, art for its own sake. Uh, it's, it's the precision that is the quality within the art that we're pursuing, if that yeah. makes sense. I, yeah. and I don't know if that's exactly what he's saying there, but that's what I was kind of reading between the lines. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Barfield is, for me, it, it's always like several readings before I'm really like clicking, yeah. no, clicking in. But I find it interesting because, first of all, Barfield talks about perception as, you know, this is what Bar Barfield plays with a lot is perception. And it comes, it well, it's not just from Rudolf Steiner, but Rudolf Steiner talks about it too. And, and Barfield, um, I don't know if you listened to that thing I sent you. Barfield did a, a, a lecture where he talks about perception. Mm. And I'm just trying to think back. He said perception precedes language. Is that what he said? I think so. I mean, that would definitely be true. Yeah. Yeah. Sensory uh, perception, absolutely. Like mm -hmm. that, you know, like our senses are. I think it's language, but I, I'd have to, I'm going to have to double check that. Maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put, if I find it, I'll, I'll put it in the uh, comment section of this video or something. But anyway, um, and so he's, He's actually, it feels to me like he's kind of astounded that it took them till what, the 15th <laughs> century? Yeah. To find out how to paint perception. And then when was the uh, camera obscure invented? The 16th and 17th centuries? Yeah. Yep. So. As soon as they discover pers perspective in painting, and he, he says it was probably just a few, not very many. As soon as they discovered it, then the camera obscura slowly came into existence, right? So you've got this evolution of consciousness happening, right? Where they, they, um, oh, okay. Thanks, Lance. Um, and... Wow, cool. Thank you. I'd like to see that. Yeah. <clears throat> Here we go. Here it is. I don't know what I'd do without you sharing. This is, um, okay, this is not like I don't know how to share screens, so we're going to go <laughs> show and tell. Uh, <laughs> oh, maybe. geez. I don't no. know. Uh, maybe I'll turn the light down on here. Hang on. Let me see. Okay. There. Can you Whoa. guys see that? What does that? Looks like a booty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't really see it while I'm holding it. I'm sorry. I'm trying. Uh, divine nature and meaning. Okay, so this is what did Lance say? It's what is this, Lance? This is a diagram mapping Barfield and Steiner perception and consciousness. Okay. Yeah. Well. I, that would, I'm going to need. You're to talking to that. a couple of poets, farmers, <laughs> <laughs> armchair philosophers. So we're like diagrams. Oh, no. We're, we get scared. Oh, oh but I would love to like look at that more closely on yeah. my own tablet. No, um, I will send it to you. I'm going to send it to you right now. Cool. Um, here we go. And what? now you have it. <laughs> Thanks to technology. Uh, so anyway, I just I just wanted to tie that in because sometimes Barfield he 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 goes to these lengths and he makes these little small trails off to the side, and it I just know from reading Saving the Appearances that it was not difficult to get lost in what he was actually saying, and um, and so one of the things that I wanted to say is he talks about how convenient this was. Um, 
the the invention of yeah, the, of the camera obscura made yeah. things easy something that was extremely difficult to do and took centuries to develop made some in in that was like artists were just beginning to grasp how to do this in their paintings we just made it reproducible like replicable like we can now snap our fingers and this anybody is and anyone can yeah. do it right because you essentially you're projecting an image onto a and you just have to yeah and you get the perspective built into it but but i find it even more fascinating that they discovered perspective in the 14th 15th centuries and then the camera obscura came into existence in the 16th and 17th centuries yeah so yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we should. You have a link, Lance, in the in the chat. I don't see it. Yeah, it didn't pop up. the The ease at which this is for the camera obscura to do this thing that mm -hmm. artists have been trying to do. I think there's something that stands out to me about that. That is. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm I'm having difficulty putting it into words, but there's something about that. It's a shortcut. It's a shortcut. And so whenever I hear shortcuts, I'm like, okay, what's lost in a shortcut? You oh. haven't taken the long route. You didn't take the scenic route. So what did you miss? You missed okay. all the beauty. You're going you're gonna to love this then. I'm going to read you a quote. This is my shortcut quote. I just don't like shortcuts all the time. I mean, sometimes they're really pragmatic and really useful, but like, yeah. Okay, here you go. Straight lines. Because <laughs> the straight line is a shortcut. Yeah. Right? Like if your path goes like this around something and you just cut through, that's a straight. Shortcut is a straight line. In 1953, I realized that the straight line leads to the downfall of mankind. But the straight line has become an absolute tyranny. The straight line is something cowardly, drawn with a ruler, without thought or feeling. It is a line which does not exist in nature. And that the line is, is the rotten foundation of our doomed civilization. Even if there are certain places where it is recognized that this line is rapidly leading to perdition, its course continues to be plotted. The straight line is godless and immoral. Oh my God. The straight line is the only uncreative line, the only line which does not suit man as the image of God. The straight line is the forbidden fruit. The straight line is the curse of our civilization. Any design undertaken with the straight line will be stillborn. Today we are witnessing the triumph of rationalist know-how, and yet at the same time we find ourselves confronted with emptiness, an aesthetic void, desert of uniformity, criminal sterility, loss of creative power. Even creativity is prefabricated. We have become impotent. We are no longer able to create. That is our real illiteracy. And that was um, that was written by a guy named Fried Friederreich Hundertwasser. And it just so happens... Oh. That my son got me this for Christmas. That's his art, but oh he was, God. but he was also an architect. And I'll I'll see if I can find some of his buildings. Um, this is also some of his art. Oops, where are we here? See that? Yeah. Um, but his buildings are. Let me see here. Let me guess, he's coloring outside the lines. <laughs> That's um, all I'm thinking yeah. about is the sun right now. So he basically, he basically, um, there he is on the back of the book. Oops, there we go. So he built buildings that didn't have any straight lines. And here's another, here's another thing. And he wasn't an anthroposoph like Barfield and Steiner. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Lance is here. Cool. Yes, come in, Lance. 
it doesn't say it says device not connected lance oh no um he'll figure it out so yeah anyway i just had to i had to share all that because you're you're making you're you're making that connection that the camera obscure was a shortcut. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. And and then you know this will show us how 